Uh, so welcome everyone to uh, day three of the AILA Life Summit 2020. Uh, so this is near the tail end of our uh, of our three day summit. It's been a pretty exciting time, and uh, obviously we're saving the best for last, or near best for last. Uh, I can lie to myself; it's great. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we're really excited to have everyone here. Uh, just uh, to give a quick introduction, my name is uh, Ross Mead. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of a robotic software company called Semio. Um, but more relevant to this life summit, I am the vice president of AILA. Uh, and uh, before I, I get into the panel, I do want to take this opportunity uh, to thank our president and uh, founder, Todd Terrazas. Uh, who you see in the chat and you've probably interacted with him throughout the day. Um, but uh, usually I get to be his hype man uh, at the beginning of any event, and we didn't do that this time. Um, but I will tell you from being around Todd every single day for months now, uh, this is what he lives, breathes, sweats, is AILA, and everything that has come out of these past three days is due to his hard work and his leadership. So he's been leading a small team of volunteers uh, uh, and, and workers on putting together some of the content, but understand that every sponsor, every speaker, every tweet, uh, every banner that you've seen has gone through him. And so if you get a chance at some point, show some love, send them, you know, uh, send him um, some positive vibes later. Let him know that you really appreciate it. His goal for the past few months is to make sure that you have a meaningful and memorable uh, experience over these three days. And so much love and appreciation to Todd. Uh, and now with that, uh, moving on to our uh, amazing panel of speakers here. So we've got uh, Professor Josh Bongard, uh, who's a professor of computer science at University of Vermont uh, and director of the Morphology, Evolution, and Cognitions Lab. Um, we have uh, Professor uh, Itai Cohen, uh, who is Professor of Physics at Cornell University and Director of the Itai Cohen Group. Uh, and then we have Dr. Nadine Dabby, a multidisciplinary scientist, engineer, and entrepreneur, uh, a COO and CTO at ModMD LA. Uh, and I think what's going to be interesting about this panel is that uh, we all work in robotics, but we all come from different perspectives. So I work at the meter level of robotics. Uh, Josh works at the uh, at the millimeter level, uh, Itai works at the micrometer level, and uh, Nadine goes down to the nanometer level. So this is each time it's like a thousand times smaller. Uh, and so I'm going to let them uh, uh, talk all about their robots this entire time. It's going to be fun. Please ask some questions as you have them. Uh, and before we get into the, the questions, though, uh, I'd like to ask each one of you uh, to uh, introduce yourselves. Let us get to know you. So uh, Josh, can we start with you? Sure. Um, thanks very much, Ross, and thanks you for for coming today. Um, I'm Josh Bongard and um, uh, my background is in computer science and robotics and most of the work in my group is on uh, teaching AI not to program robots but to design robots and I'm going to talk particularly today about uh, our Xenobots and uh, I'll just play a short video here so you can get a sense of what they look like. So these are, uh, this is um, a Xenobot you see in the bottom here. This is a physical Xenobot. It's about a millimeter across. As Ross was saying, we work at about the millimeter scale. What you're seeing in the top is the uh, simulated Xenobot that was designed uh, by a machine learning algorithm running on a supercomputer uh, inside a physics engine. Uh, over about a month on our supercomputer, we went through 3.9 billion designs. This was the best one. Uh, we managed to build this uh, Xenobot, which you see at the bottom, and as you can tell, it isn't made from metal and ceramics uh, and electronics. We built it up frog cell by frog cell, so you're looking at uh, a frog, but not a frog. And again, just for scale, you can see my PhD student, Sam Kriegman, who's, uh, who's got a, one Xenobot uh, entrapped in a slide here, so you got a sense for, for how big they are. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions today about the uh, answer questions today about sort of the computational AI side of this. If there are hard biology questions, I will defer uh, you to my uh, biology colleagues, Mike Levin and Doug Blackiston uh, at Tufts. I'm looking forward to the panel. Thanks, Josh. And uh, uh, up next, uh, at a thousand times smaller, <laughs> we've got uh, Edai. All right. Uh... I'm trying to share uh, my application window. 
All right, so um, the things that I'm going to be talking about are microscopic robots. Um, and the big idea here is that these days we can make computer chips arbitrarily small. Uh, this is a, a pair of my colleagues, Al Molnar and Paul McEwen. They've built little computer chips. This particular one is a voltage meter, has two pads for measuring voltage differences, a bank of photovoltaics, a transistor, and a little LED. And the idea is that um, these are super small. So uh, our competitors' uh, chips, you can see here on, on the left, uh, on a penny, these are the kinds of chips that you might find in a pill that you would swallow and takes pictures of your gut. And our devices are, are here on the right. And the reason you don't see them is that uh, there are actually two Lincolns on the Lincoln uh, Memorial uh, penny. Uh, one is on the front and one is inside the Lincoln Memorial. And if I blow that up, on the chest of that Lincoln is the devices that we're talking about. And what we've decided to do is to try to put legs on these devices and try to make uh, origami uh, microchip robots. And so the way this works is that you design a material that can expand when you apply a voltage to it by absorbing ions onto one side of the material to make it bend. And uh, here's us essentially applying a voltage to this uh, little thin ribbon, nanometer thin ribbon. And once you have this working uh, at will, you know, we can just turn the knob and make it bend. You can start to attach it to things like photovoltaics. And so here is a device that's attached to a photovoltaic. So I shine light on the photovoltaic and it waves hello at you. This is our first device. It says, hello world. And now you can start to get ambitious and put back legs and front legs and make thousands of them on a chip and uh, put little pads on in order to restrict the bending to where you want so that you can get something that looks like this. This is Brobot. Uh, he has a lot of uh, hair on him and he's flexing his muscles. He belongs on a beach somewhere in LA with you guys. You shine light on the front photovoltaic and he bends his front arms. But you see Brobot's got a lot of defects. Uh, you know, his back legs have been ripped off. Um, but you know, he's pretty resilient. You can, you can pounce on him, he still works. And if you work really hard, as our uh, postdoc did, you can get a device that's clean and essentially folds itself up and walks off the Petri dish. This is a 40 by 70 micron robot. It fits within a single hair diameter. Uh, it is so small that these little particles that are next to it are Brownian, which means that the fluid molecules are jostling them randomly. Um, and with a robot this small, you can start to think about putting payloads like those voltmeters and thermos, uh, thermal sensors and LEDs. In fact, on that little 10 micron by 20, 10 micron area, you could fit an entire Intel 4004 chip. And so that brings you to a gigabit clock rate. And for comparison, the Voyager 1, which just left our solar system, has an 8 kilobits per second clock rate, uh, 60 megabits of memory. And so now, you have to imagine what you could do with 10 million of these, which we can release from a single wafer, each costing about a penny, can lift about 10 times its weight, and has the computational power of the spaceship Voyager. And then where do we go? So that's uh, those are the robots that I'll be telling you about today. That is amazing. I have so many questions that I didn't think about going into this. So. Uh... I'll, I'll, I'll tone down my excitement. Um, and uh, uh, now going, because that wasn't small enough, I don't know how many scales of Lincoln down we are, but a thousand times smaller than the robots that uh, Edai is working on, uh, Nadine. So Ross, why did you put me last after these two guys? I feel like they're so tough to follow. Um, uh, so, okay. <laughs> uh, my, so so uh, the robots I've worked with were actually built out of DNA. Um, and they were about 10 big. And one of, one of those robots actually crawled around like the ones that Itai showed, except uh, it did so, if you could imagine like a lawnmower that's powered by grass and, it, and it's powered by the mechanism of cutting the grass, that's how it operated. Um, and in terms of scale, uh, we're talking uh, about one ten thousandth of the thickness of a strand of hair. So that's the realm we're talking about. And um, I'm just gonna leave it at that and let's keep going. <laughs> that's great, no, no. And, and yeah, we're gonna dive deeper into each of your robots here. So actually uh, on those lines, you know, uh, 
I, I do want to try and create a, uh, a clear picture for the audience when we talk about our robots and, and what they're doing, uh, because there's, there's sometimes a, uh, it's not super well defined sometimes what a robot is. And so uh, let's start by uh, the idea that a robot typically has a well-defined physical structure or body uh, that operates inside of a well-defined physical environment, such as a home, a warehouse, or a, a factory floor. Uh, and it's typically accomplishing a well-defined task, such as picking and placing items uh, up off of a shelf. Uh, and so you all work in these very different subfields of robotics. Um, you kind of gave us a sense of what the robots look like, but uh, in what environments are they operating in and what tasks are they doing in those environments? And jump in. So um, when I was uh, talking about this with Ross, I was sort of explaining that, you know, this field of molecular robotics is pretty new. Um, there are quite a few practitioners across the world working on it. Um, and uh, I think the best way to think about it is actually to think that we're trying to emulate um, all of the, you know, trillions of types of molecular robots that already exist in the natural world, um, that like all the proteins and deoxyribozymes and enzymes that, um, that power our, our physical world. And, um, and an example of what they can do is um, thinking about, for example, my favorite example is metamorphosis. So like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly that's powered by, you know, moles worth <laughs> of protein, um, which is kind of like imagining a motorcycle turn into an SUV while it's driving. So that's sort of the way to think about it, except at a different scale. <laughs> they eat your heart out. Right. Yeah, I, I think um, so. Uh, this this idea of essentially co-opting biology, I mean, I, I think this is what Nadine and, and Josh are about. And, um, our robots are trying to, um, we can't do the same sort of sophisticated things yet that Josh and Nadine's robots can do, but we're trying to build, uh, you know, the equivalent of a tractor instead of a, a horse. So we're trying to be complementary and bring in um, hard materials like platinum and graphene that have stiffnesses that are way beyond what you would get from a uh, biological material. And the idea is really not to try to compete with biology, but offer a complementary approach towards accessing, you know, that micro scale. And, and the environment that we're working on is at, you know, the, the 100 to, to 10 to 100 micron scale. That's the scale of a single cell. And the idea then is to try to think about how do we how do we reconceive our interactions with the micro, microscopic world? Instead of looking down through a microscope at it, now we're gonna be able to operate within it and start to think about what it's like to be a cell pushing on other you know, materials. And you know, all of that's gonna be fascinating as we try to learn what we're doing. I, I agree that um... We're trying to reach down into these lower levels, and, and the, the spirit of robotics has always been to create machines that can take care of the four Ds, the dirty, dull, distant, and I forget what the, the fourth one is, but the, the distance dangerous. here, I think, dangerous, thank you, of course, dangerous. So the, the distant here, at least up until recently with Nadine's work and Itai's work and, and our work and, and others is again, being able to, to create uh, the tractor or the horse to be able to do human directed useful work at the very small scale and I think that's a, a common three theme across uh, all three of our projects. In the, the case of the xenobots which are frogs but not frogs uh, in terms of the environment it's any environment that you'd find a frog so room temperature pond water um, with the idea that eventually and this is we're still at the basic science stage so there's we're not applying or not uh, deploying them into the, the wild yet but could we actually introduce them into a natural environment where they might have less environmental impact than if we were introducing a machine made out of metals and plastics and ceramics so i think that's the long-term goal of the environment that we have in mind for our machines gotcha and so yeah so we understand now like you know what they look like and the scale uh they're in what kind of tasks they're doing, um, sort of elaborating on all that, uh, we often think of a robot as having uh, sensing mechanisms like cameras and lasers and microphones or bumpers. Um, 
uh, to sense things in the environment. Uh, it often has decision-making mechaniz mechanisms such as like remote control from a human operator or autonomous control from AI software. Uh, and then it often has some sort of actuation mechanisms, arms, legs, et cetera, uh, to act based on decisions that it's made. And so uh, how do your robots sense and act on the environment and how are they controlled? Is it like an, is it a human operator, an AI or something else? Yeah, I mean, I think my robots are the most um, similar to what you've described. Uh, we basically, uh, you know, give them signals through light. Uh, in this particular case that I showed you, we were shining light on photovoltaics, but very quickly we're now gonna start moving into integrating computer chips. So you could power it with light and then the computer chip itself could start to make decisions based on what it's sensing, voltages, temperature, things like that. And so that's where our robot is moving. And it's very similar to a, a typical robot uh, that, that you just described. Yeah, so in the, case of the, in the case of the xenobots, they have no sense organs, they have no nervous tissue, so they have no brain. So our original understanding of what the AI was designing was basically a fancy wind-up uh, wind toy. So what, Anna, what the frogbots do have is the ability to move, which you could see from the video, and that's because they include a heart muscle tissue from frogs. So tissue that just spontaneously contracts and expands, and so you have something that looks like a wind-up toy. We found that when you take multiple xenobots and put them in the bottom of a Petri dish and you sprinkle small particulate mat matter that's smaller than the xenobots, they seem to actually collect the material into piles and seem to be working together, which is kind of surprising because first of all, as far as we know, they can't sense the pellets. They can't think about what to do with the pellets or coordinate their action, which is very surprising for a roboticist. As most roboticists know, the robots usually do much less than what you wish they would do. But if you're building out of biological materials, obviously the cells themselves, which make up the robots, are very complex machines and robots in their own right. An individual cell can sense and think about its environment and act on its environment. So there is some sensation and, and possibly cells inside an individual xenobot are talking to one another to coordinate the action of the, of the xenobot relative to its environment and possibly xenobots are talking to one another, but that's not something we're sure about yet. The chat, I should just say it. it what you just said totally reminds me of um, a book. I don't know if you've read it or heard of it called Vehicles, Experiments in Synthetic Psychology. Have you heard of it? You have. It's, that's <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, one of my favorites, um, but it's all sort of about, you know, humans sort of attributing personalities and behaviors onto things that are actually quite simple. Right. Um, in terms of my, my robots, um, I think, you know, the environment that, that we imagine them operating in is a liquid environment, and they're, and they're sort of operating by the mechanisms of chemistry and mass action kinetics. Um, so I would imagine deploying them, you know, eventually, like not now, but eventually the, the goal would be um, that they that they would replace, you know, medicine or, you know, go into your body to heal things or or potentially be used in manufacturing and fabrication to uh, to have a cleaner way of producing things that's more sustainable. Um, and I don't even remember the beginning of the question anymore. <laughs> Oh, it was about sensing, planning, and acting, basically. How do you sense, plan, and act? Right. Okay. Yes, exactly. So sensing, planning, and acting. So, right. So they're governed by mass action kinetics. So instead of having one robot like you'd have at the meter scale or a team of robots like you'd have in swarm robotics um, or modular robotics, um, now you might have like a million or 10 million or a mole's worth of these molecules. And, and some percent of them will react and some percent of them won't. Um, and the way that they're, and the, the way that they're sensing is by touching, right? Because they're not, there is no central memory unit anymore. There isn't even, you know, I mean, there's been a, a very interesting explorations in optogenetics, uh, which I'm sure somebody talked about in one of the many discussions in synthetic biology uh, over the course of the summit. Um, but 
you know, so, so potentially there is a way to interact with these molecules using light or other things from the outside world. But the way that they're interacting with each other and other substrates is by touching each other. And then the actuation comes by um, either uh, changing the shape or configuration or cleaving something like, uh, for example, CRISPR, you're, you're cutting, you're cutting and pasting with, with CRISPR, which is more of a synthetic biology tool. Um, and then, wait, sensing, actuating, and what was the other one? Planning or AI. Planning, <laughs> right. So the planning isn't there. The planning, I mean, in the real, in the natural world, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that you can really describe evolution as a planner, but um, in, in this molecular robotics world, there has to be sort of an abstraction that humans are applying to imagine how these things get planned out. And so um, one, of, one of the projects I'm still working on publishing, it's been many years as Ross knows, <laughs> um, you know, we, we came up with a mechanism by which we could, for example, grow a, a linear polymer in logarithmic time. Um, and that is something where we came up with a scheme and we figured out how to sort of abstract it into a set of molecules that could perform that task. But ultimately, for this to become a usable tool, um, you kind of have to have a language for programming it, the same way that you have a language in computer science to write a, a Java program or, or whatever. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, it's, and one thing I will clarify is when I talk about planning, I guess it doesn't have to be planning, right? You can have robots where their sensor outputs are tied directly into motor inputs. Maybe it's more decision-making or the control that uh, we're trying to get out there. And so um, everything that you're talking about right now, it's kind of making me think, uh, you know, the, at, the, at the scale that you're operating in, uh, physical forces become problematic, I would imagine. So, you know, uh, this is, you know, robots are distinguished from virtual worlds and virtual characters um, uh, where the virtual characters are not subject to real physics. Like you can't type in a cheat code to make the robot suddenly walk or fly, <laughs> right? Uh, and so uh, robots in the real world are subject to the forces of physics. Uh, they're subject to errors in their sensor and motor systems and uncertainty in, in what's actually going on in the world uh, or even the impacts of its actions. Um, and so uh, for, for your applications, how do real world physics come into play and error and uncertainty? How do those factor into your robots? Well, before we tackle that one, I think Itai's robots have rose up and uh, rebelled. Have we lost Itai? No, I'm, I'm still here. Oh, oh there he's he is. There. Oh, he's okay, there. okay. I've been I frozen just... for a sec, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I, just, I just stay very still. <laughs> okay, there you go. I, I guess I, I lost your video. Anyways, um, so in the case of the, the Xenobots, it's kind of an interesting case. You were distinguishing between the virtual world and the physical world. The, the Xenobots, in an interesting way, live in both worlds. So as I mentioned before, um, the AI part of our project is the AI is designing these Xenobots and simulation to try and figure out what the best design is before our microsurgeon Doug Blackiston builds them cell by cell by cell. So they have sort of this dual life. They're, they're living in the simulation and we're trying to transfer both the shape and tis tissue distribution and the behavior. How much of that can we transfer from the virtual world into the physical world? The, the big challenge here is that we know some things about how frog heart muscle tissue works when you rearrange it, um, but there's lots we don't know. So we had to tell the AI that basically it's building things out of Lego bricks. And from its point of view, it doesn't know that those Lego bricks are gonna become frog cells. But we tell it that one type of the red, the red Lego bricks, which are the heart muscle tissue, you put them together and they're gonna beat, they're gonna expand and contract, but we don't know the phase offset. So we don't know whether if we put pieces of tissue together, they'll talk to each other and expand and contract uh, together, which they'll do if they're in the shape of a frog heart, which is good news for the frog because everything beats together and acts like a pump. Um, you don't want a heart that where parts of the heart pump an antiphase to one another. 
So um, this is almost an impossible task for a human engineer to tell them to build a machine that has reliable behavior at the organismal, at the organismal uh, scale, but it's built out of parts that are acting somewhat randomly. And it turns out, one of the things that's interesting from an AI point of view of this project is that the AI is actually able to solve this problem. It can build reliable machines out of almost completely unreliable parts. And that, for us, that's the, the interesting physics part of this project. Yeah, for, um, for our robots, uh, you know, there's a piece of this which is, uh, you know, completely exact. So when we uh, design and build computer chips in our uh, fab, uh, they basically work as designed, uh, you know, and we pretty much understand all of that. Um, but building a robot at the micro scale is a completely different challenge from doing it at the macro scale. You can't just uh, have you know pieces that you screw together and um, you know then assemble your robot. Uh, and Van der Waals forces, which essentially uh, bond surfaces together, are a pain in the butt. And so it's it's really um, a major task to to build such robots. And so the way that we've gone about it is we actually use the same technology that we use to fabricate the computer chips to lay down a two-dimensional pattern that we then fold up into the three-dimensional robot. And so we use origami and kirigami design principles uh, to essentially build the robot up from a two-dimensional uh, footprint. Once you build the robot, then physics comes into it again uh, you know, the way that it moves, you have to, uh, you know, plan it properly and you have to make sure that uh, because these robots are underwater, they're essentially working at the water um, sub, uh, solid substrate interface. Um, you basically have to have them grip onto something as they move. Uh, you have to make sure that they can overcome the viscosity of the fluid that they're surrounded by. When one robot moves, it drags another robot behind it. Uh, just from the fluid forces. So all of that has to be taken into account, especially when you're trying to make uh, a swarm of a million of these robots uh, like we're gearing up to do. I think at the, uh, I think at the mo molecular scale, it's almost a little bit simpler than at ETI scale. Um, I mean, obviously error, you know, like I said, you're, you're operating under the forces of chemistry now. But one thing that's nice about chemistry is you have Brownian motion and random jiggling of particles that that sort of sometimes helps reactions to happen. Um, but of course, you know, it's like in the chemistry world, it's all about yield, right? So you're not going to get a hundred percent signal. You know, you put a one in and the signal propagates through the system to do exactly what you want. What you're looking for is a 50% yield of the thing that you're trying to build. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's an interesting challenge and it's a good question. Um, and, and it makes you again, want to seek inspiration from biology to sort of understand how biological systems can work so well, given the constraints of, of operating under these sort of pretty unpredictable circumstances. Um, but you know, you could also say it's not a, what, is, what do they say in computer science? It's not a bug, it's a, it's a feature. feature. <laughs> and so, so you, you, if you approach it that way and, uh, and, and that sort of um, goes along with what I was saying before about um, the need to sort of systemize, systematize the way that we think about these systems. Um, and something that I've been lobbying for <laughs> you know, albeit to a very small group of people, is for more work by the by theoreticians to think about extending the way they think about computer science theory to to apply to these other conditions like uh, synthetic biology and chemistry and molecular programming. Because, in my opinion, and now I'm going I'm going off the rails on the question, so I hope that's okay, Ross. Um, in my opinion, the greatest gift that computer science gave the world was our was its ability to make it very clear to us what is a hard problem and what is an easy problem. And we have a way now of categorizing that and thinking about that. And and being able to, for example, compare a class of problems, you know, 
massive problem. Um, one of the weird findings, like in my research with this as yet published paper that we haven't published yet, but that you can find in my dissertation if you want to look it up. <laughs> Spoiler alert is what we're getting at. Spoiler alert. Uh, we discovered, you know, with this with this uh, exponentially fast growing polymer, that we could program something that cannot be emulated or simulated by a Turing complete molecular system. It cannot be done uh, with a system that's actually equivalent to like a push down automaton, which is a much simpler computational model, and that sort of turns on its head the notion of these theoretical categories of computer science because. For most, most of computer science theory is sort of about, um, you know, oh, a Turing machine can do anything. But really, all it's doing is simulating something. But all of that breaks when you start thinking about simulating something in the physical world, using real world time, real world space, and real world constraints. So there you go. I, I think you shocked Itai and he <laughs> fumbled everything, fumbled everything. Um, uh, so, so I will toss out, we did have one question from the chat from uh, Hector Garcia Martin. Uh, it was directed at Itai, but I'm going to open it up to everyone, which was uh, how much do you control the movement of your robots? And I'm going to try and tie this into a, a, a bit more of a general question. So, um, you know, robots in oh, at my scale, at like the meter scale, we're typically doing things like object recognition and then some sort of object manipulation. We're trying to uh, manipulate things in the environment to, to perform some sort of task. So grabbing things off of a shelf or like, you know, various pick and place, uh, find and fetch kind of activities are, are, are the common thoughts. Um, how are you controlling your robots, both in terms of their mobility as well as their manipulation? And what are they manipulating? I mean, in, in our robots, um, basically everything is voltage based. So the idea is that um, we have these actuators that uh, will bend, and the more voltage you apply, the more they bend. Basically, you oxidize a layer of the material, which then uh, stresses one side of the thin film relative to the other, and that gives you a bending uh, behavior. And we uh, then put on the pads to make sure that the folding happens where we want it. And so all of it is controlled by voltage signals. And um, we're still working on developing sensors, which will allow us to know how much force the, uh, the limbs of the robot are putting on uh, a various object or on the ground that they're walking on. Uh, so those things are still under uh, development. But basically, we design the motions of the robot uh, to be whatever we want and we use the voltage to control it and that's supplied by the computer chips that we're using to control them so in the case of the xenobots as i mentioned they don't have any nervous tissue so we can't they don't have any brains to control their action um, there's no electronics so we're not we're not programming the xenobots it's actually the where we lay down various tissues which determines how the robot will move and that's how we control the behavior of of the robot. And back to something that Nadine said, uh, as a computer scientist, that, that's kind of mind-blowing because blow, it's a paradigm shift away from how we think about controlling machines is programming behavior into them. That is not the case in nature. Cells determine what they're going to do based on where they are in the body. And that's true in our biological machines as well. So our biology colleagues turn to us and say, what can we get them to do next? And my answer at the moment is, I have no idea. I don't even know how to approach the control problem, the programming problem. I don't know if it's a P or NP complete problem. It's kind of a whole new frontier for us. But it, this is one of the things I love about being a novice in the field of synthetic biology is it just forces you to throw a lot of cherished paradigms out the window and start from scratch. Talk. Josh, Absolutely. we should talk. <laughs> we, will. we will. We will. I'm gonna. I'm gonna reach out to you on LinkedIn. Um, Wonderful. In in my case, you know, I, it's it's very actually similar to what Josh. We're actually it's sort of like we're on parallel trains of thought, except on different scales. Because um, what I would argue is that the way that you control them is by controlling what else is in the environment. And so, in in one of the works uh, uh, projects that I worked on. You know, like the, specifically the, the lawnmower example, 
you're controlling where the robot goes by, deci by designing where the grass is because the grass is fueling the motion. Um, but I would say in general, you know, it's, it's about uh, designing what's in the system and what's accessible. Maybe pre-positioning certain items in certain places if localization matters. Um, but again, you're not pre-positioning one thing, you're pre-positioning 10,000 of those things on their, on their path. Um, and then the, the other thing I would say is, you know, in terms of, of, of how we control them, part of that is built into the molecular design, like the molecular programming work that, that I've, I've done is very much co-opting, you know, mechanisms that already sort of exist in nature. So um, one of the tools would be something like a deoxyribozyme or an enzyme, which maybe has a cutting behavior. Or um, uh, you can rigidize a molecule by designing it in a certain way. So for example, um, um, one of my colleagues in the field of DNA nanotechnology came up with the concept of DNA origami, and that was quickly expanded into, um, by other people into 3D origami, where you can actually design structures by having them fold up into a certain shape, just by designing like a sequence of DNA that wants to stick in a certain way. Um, and then I, I have other colleagues, uh, some at UCLA and some at other places that are, um, that are then creating these uh, chemical reaction networks and building oscillators using these chemicals that are just, they're not, you know, they're molecules that are just interacting with a repeated behavior or pattern. So those are sort of the tools that we're starting to work with. And then if, if you, I bet if you spoke to a synthetic biologist, although I might consider Josh a synthetic biologist at your, at your scale, your xenobots are, are examples of synthetic biology. Um, you know, you're operating with tools that are on the cell scale or even on the protein scale. Gotcha. We've got we've got a, a, a few questions in the chat. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, wrap them into to some general questions that I know we've discussed before. So um, uh, there was a question about you know what is the thing you run synthetically uh, uh, bio designed actors affecting evolutionary based biology in unknown possibly negative ways. I'm going to take this one question. You can address that question directly or uh, more broadly. Uh, bring up the fact that you know when we talk about AI and robotics, uh, we're often bringing up questions uh, surrounding the ethical use of the technologies uh, and their impacts on society. Um, whether this be replacing certain people in the case of some forms of like assembly line automation, or supplementing rather than replacing caregivers uh, when a caregiver can't be available, uh, augmenting human capability through robot prosthesis, uh, or even creating entirely new workforces. There are a lot of ethical discussions here. And so um, let's talk about it. What are some uh, ethical considerations surrounding the use cases for your robots? So many. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with the good ones and the bad ones, however you want to. There's, I'll, there's I'll none like for the xenobots. They're perfectly safe. No, I, <laughs> I think this, this is a valid question. Um, my, my family used to give me a hard time when I worked on traditional robots. They said, why are you trying to create the Terminator? And then I showed them the xenobots and you know, took, it to, took it to the next level. Um, I think <laughs> go back go exactly. Back. Uh, obviously, there are ethical, many, many ethical risks about creating uh, uh, some, uh, robots from biological material, and, and I'm sure Nadine will have a lot to say on that. Personally, I think, however, in many cases it is worth the risk because we have a moral imperative to be able to try and control and fix things at the very small scale. And the current pandemic is a clear example. We don't have very good control over things at the small scale. As engineers, we've shown that we can, in some ways, make the world a better place by fixing things and making machines. We've also made mistakes along the way, but we cannot make any machines at the moment at the very small scale that are helpful to humans or other organisms. And I feel we have a moral imperative to, to at least try and try and balance that, make sure that those outweigh the, the ethical risks of trying to create these kinds of technologies. But it is a very important point. I, I have an answer that actually addresses both questions, if that's okay. Can I go next, Itai? Is that okay? Sure, go for it. <laughs> um, so absolutely, ethical considerations are huge. Um, whenever you're working with biological matter, uh, thinking about releasing them into the wild is, is a huge 
thing that has to be thought about. And one of the examples that comes screaming to my mind right now is the example of the case with CRISPR, where a scientist in China decided to insert that into uh, an embryo of, an, of unborn twin babies. And by the way, we have no idea what happens to human babies when they grow up, when, when they have CRISPR screwing around with their genes. Um, we also don't know, uh, I, I believe that was also a germline change. Uh, sorry, yes, a germline change, meaning it will get passed down through the generations. Um, so that's a very scary thing to think about. I know, but at the same time, the flip side of that is that when you look at 2020 <laughs> and this crazy year that we've had and the fact that climate change is 100% real and happening, uh, even though some people still don't believe it's happening, um, you know, there's, there is an opportunity that perhaps this kind of nanotechnology can swoop in and help. The, the other thing that I always think about is that it's like, it's like the same intelligence and creativity that gives us Bach or Mozart or music is also the same creativity that gives us a gun or a nuclear bomb. So you might have a fusion reactor, which can give us clean energy as long as it's not broken in an earthquake, or it's the same you know, intelligence that's giving us you know, one of the most devastating kinds of weapons on the planet. And you know, with what is what did what is what what did, what did uh, uh, Peter Parker's uncle said with with great respons well, with great power comes great responsibility and and I would say that I'd have to leave it with that thought. Yeah, from our perspective, um, you know, the kinds of things that we're thinking about are shrinking down the surgeon to the scale of, you know, tens of cells or something like that, and I don't see a big ethical uh, dilemma there. Um, there are people who are worried that our little microbots are going to um, self-reproduce and take over the world in some sort of gray goo uh, mass, and I can assure you that's not going to happen. Uh, the way that these robots are made is with huge machines that are able to essentially drill down to very, very small atomically thin scales in order to lay down materials one layer at a time. That is not the kind of dexterity that our robots have and will ever have. Um, in addition, the, the robots um, themselves are, they, they need light uh, to be powered. Um, so, uh, you know, at the moment they have to operate pretty peripherally in the body. Uh, once we start getting them uh, to be powered inside the body, then you could worry that one of these things will sort of crawl around your brain and start to uh, twinkle a neuron here and there. Um, I'd like to say that uh, th that was a closer possibility than it, than it actually is, but it, we're still very far away from uh, having anything like that happen. Can, can I? Um, oh. never, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to add uh, more applications, but I want you to finish, so. Yeah, no, so, you know, so I think there's, there's you know, uh, definitely places in the future where there may be things to um, to consider in terms of, you know, what's okay to put inside of a person. Um, but on the other hand, the, the particular robots that we're making are so small that the volume of material that they contain um, in terms of like toxicity is, is negligible. So we're not too worried about that part. Um, okay, a couple more applications on my end. Um, you know, if you can imagine building like molecular robots that could actually be deployed in a human body, you're talking about possibilities like solving cancer in a native way that doesn't involve radiation or poison ingestion. Um, if you can think about applying this kind of nanotechnology to fabrication, you can now sort of imagine the possibility of planting a seed to build a house. You know, I, obviously it wouldn't work like that. It would be slow, right? But, um, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like, like one of the promises, one of the holy grails is, is, is the idea that you, we're, we're looking at a sustainable future and a place where, where, the, where, where we're solving problems using the very, the very uh, fabric that the problems are in. So. Uh, actually, that's very nicely uh, into what I think is probably gonna be our last question uh, for, uh, for the evening. Uh, I'm actually saying for the evening, 
everyone, where are you? I'm in downtown <laughs> Los Angeles. Where is everyone? It's definitely evening here. I'm in the, the opposite corner of the country, Vermont. Okay. Yeah. And it's evening in uh, Ithaca, New York as well. I'm in Venice Beach and the sun is just starting to go down. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get you to the sunset. How's that? <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, just, just to try and wrap this up, let's talk a little bit about application. Uh, this, was, this question was also brought up in the chat. Um, so you know, robots are often used to solve problems uh, or tasks that humans could do um, and sometimes are already doing and solving. Um, however, the value of a robot we usually think of is is often found, like Josh said, in the uh, in the 4D tasks, so dirty, dangerous, dull, and distant. Um, so, how are humans currently solving some of the problems that your robots might solve, and uh, what would you see the primary benefit or value uh, that your robots might have for uh, humanity and society? Yeah. So I, I sort of already mentioned a little bit about uh, the microsurgery. So basically a, um, putting these robots at the end of an endoscope that you could uh, thread through a, a vein or an artery would allow you to perform very delicate surgeries that at the moment um, we can't do. Uh, and then having them be more autonomous would allow you, for example, to have robots, let's say you have a, a patient, um, they're in an operating theater, uh, they're opened up, uh, and there's some sort of uh, cancerous uh, tumor that's grown into some tissue that's very hard to remove. And so instead of a scalpel, you, you inject a, a million of these robots, they crawl up the chemical gradients and start slicing up the tumor cells. So that would be like a, a fantastic um, vision. You know, beyond that, um, you know, if we start thinking about going to places like Mars, uh, we're gonna have to start miniaturizing our factories and so having machines that can build slightly bigger machines, that can build slightly bigger machines, that's kind of what we are, machines built on machines, built on machines. And the question is whether or not you could in the future have a factory that has these tiny robots powered by algorithms that allow them to just do repetitive tasks and assemble things uh, at larger scales, maybe even um, uh, gardening or tending uh, some sort of artificial tissue, uh, um, you know, layer and sort of getting rid of the cells that are bad or grouping cells that need to be grouped together in order for the tissue to function. So swarms of those kinds of robots could do things that we could only, um, that we can't even imagine doing with the current tools that we have. So I would say uh, um, Itai and, and Nadine have covered a lot of the interesting um, practical applications. One of the things that I think is particularly interesting about the Xenobots as biological robots is they're not just an engineering tool or could someday be an engineering tool, but also a scientific tool. So the Xenobots are built under the microscope, but in a way they are also a new kind of microscope. So what I mean by that is what we're exploring now is trying to tell the AI to build a Xenobot which is um, interrogatable, that it advertises how the cells are talking to one another inside the Xenobot um, in a way that's easier for us to see and understand than if you look at a normal frog or a human or any other organism. So can they offer up the biological secrets, the infinite number of biological secrets that we know nothing about at the moment and understand a little bit better about how cells and tissues and organs work together. The, the first lesson that Xenobots have taught us is that you can rearrange frog tissue in extremely strange ways and they'll still work. They'll still produce a functioning machine. Uh, COVID-19 has reprogrammed the human species and they've rearranged us pretty deeply this year. And how are we doing? I mean, not bad, but we could learn a lot. So I think this, this general idea, you know, one of the holy grails in science, which is understanding how global, coordinated global behavior emerges from lots of interacting parts that can still produce that function when you rearrange that part, those parts. We as a species don't understand that at all size scale. So I think what, personally one of the most exciting applications of Xenobots is getting them to teach us a little bit more about how that phenomenon works. Um, and I would just add, um, you know, we're, we're starting to get to the limits of what traditional manufacturing can manufacture. 
I don't know if you've been following. Uh, I worked at Intel for a while, so I've been following the ability to like fabricate chips just to tag onto what Itai was saying, because like, it's real, you're, you're getting to a point where like, you just can't really have that much optical control over your material when you're fabbing things. Um, and I would also say like, you know, I mean, COVID and all of these like fires and disasters and hurricanes, all of it goes back to this climate change problem. And all of that has to do with the way that we're using energy and the way that we're producing waste that's just feeding into this giant like Texas sized continent of garbage in the in the in the ocean. And I think I really think that like when we start thinking about um, sustainable manufacturing, like there's like a a biological imperative to start, you know, reimagining the way that we build and you and you build things and use energy and and function as a society because we're talking about like an existential threat to our species and our planet. Um, and, and while there are some on our planet that believe that we can just create a colony on Mars and everything will be fine, I personally would like to salvage Earth, which is our home. And I'm also a fan of Battlestar Galactica, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get Todd to watch BSG as well. So maybe oh my you can God, push him right so over the good. edge. There you go. It's Any so BSG good. fans to in the chat? S send some love our way. Uh, with that, uh, we are at the end of our panel. Uh, I'd love to thank our panelists. Uh, this is fantastic. I've learned a lot. I have a ton of questions, so I'll ask you offline. Um, but uh, yes, uh, thank you again for joining uh, panelists. Thank you for uh, members of the chat. Uh, and uh, please join the, uh, the next panel as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. So yeah, nice take to it meet easy. you guys. Likewise. You too. Bye-bye. Ha, ha, ha.